Buonasera a tutti e a tutte, grazie della pazienza per questo nostro piccolo ritardo. Abbiamo una serata molto particolare, abbiamo avuto la fortuna che il nostro ospite abbia potuto raggiungere, malgrado la neve, eh, Torino, è partito da Innsbruck questa mattina eh, in condizioni climatiche avverse, temerariamente è riuscito a raggiungerci. Io credo che tutti voi faccia piacere questa sua presenza, noi abbiamo eh, approfittato della presenza a Torino eh, di eh, Fritti of Capra eh, per fare un evento che è al tempo stesso formale e informale, per noi è formale nella misura in cui questa è un po' una lezio magistralis per l'inaugurazione del nostro anno accademico, ma eh, sarebbe stato un peccato tenerla al chiuso e quindi sarà un evento eh, aperto, un evento anche speriamo interessante per la cittadinanza. E dicevo l'inaugurazione dell'anno accademico dell'International University College di Torino, eh, un'istituzione eh, che compie quest'anno dieci anni, eh, dieci anni di attività accademica nei quali eh, ormai più di 250 studenti hanno conseguito il Master in, economia, in Diritto, Economia e Finanze eh, attraverso un percorso di studio che si svolge interamente in inglese eh, nelle, nel perfezionare gli studi con un carattere che ha molta eh, familiarità, somiglianza con l'ospite di questa sera. Degli studi particolarmente trasversali a cui arrivano studenti che hanno un background molto diversificato, non sono tutti rigorosamente inquadrati né tra i giuristi né tra gli economisti né tra i sociologi, c'è un, un bouquet molto ampio di competenze così come molto ampio è lo spettro degli apporti accademici che arrivano al college da docenti molti dei quali di altissimo profilo scientifico e reputazione internazionale. Siamo tra gli altri a Guido Calabresi, che è ospite abituale, eh, consueto del, del college, ex eh, preside della eh, facoltà di legge di, eh, di Yale. Di Yale. Eh, abbiamo, abbiamo poi avuto e abbiamo... Eh, Ian Toporowski, abbiamo Gunther Teubner, molti eh, studiosi di fama internazionale arrivano, hanno in Torino e in particolare nell'International University College il loro punto di riferimento. Credo che poi sull'apprezzamento sull di questi studi potrà anche dire eh, il rappresentante oggi del, del mondo studentesco che è qui presente con noi, che è Zeleke Temesgen, I hope it's correctly pronounced, yes, eh, e che ci darà anche quindi il punto di vista eh, degli studenti, proprio perché in particolare ai nostri studenti è dedicata la serata, eh, la serata stessa si svolgerà prevalentemente in inglese, ma ci saranno anche dei momenti di eh, sintesi che eh, Ugo Mattei, che insieme a Fritjof Capra ha appena prodotto un libro di straordinario interesse eh, vorrà, vorrà fare eh, per fare anche eh, nell'eventualità che qualcuno abbia minor dimistichezza con l'inglese eh, fare un po' di, eh, di chiarezza, di sintesi sulle argomentazioni. Peraltro Frizio Capra non avrebbe bisogno di eh, interprete, è anche eh, un ottimo italofono, eh, si esprime molto bene la nostra lingua, è già stato anche molte volte in Italia, complice anche l'amore per lo sci che lo porta a frequentare anche questo versante delle Alpi. Eh, detto questo dell'International College che rimane una realtà forse tra le più aperte, le più internazionali di Torino, eh, un terzo degli studenti che ci sono arrivati viene dall'Asia, un quarto dall'Africa, quasi un quarto dal Sud America, sono presenze che arricchiscono molto il tessuto di questa città e che vengono accompagnate da un eccellente lavoro di ricerca, ho la presunzione di dirlo non essendo, non essendo io stesso un 
ricercatore né un docente presso l'istituzione ma soltanto eh, avendo questa funzione servente di presidente eh, posso dire della qualità, della qualità del lavoro che viene svolto e anche del lavoro di restituzione sociale dell'impegno che attraverso le legal clinics fa attraverso l'ottimo lavoro di Ulrich Stege della sua squadra eh, fa eh, nei confronti della città di Torino e nei confronti eh, di chi eh, ha particolarmente bisogno di eh, un sostegno dato generosamente e pro bono dai nostri studenti e dai nostri docenti eh, per, eh, per, eh, in particolare per eh, le eh, questioni legate alla migrazione e ai diritti dei, dei migranti. Eh, detto questo non mi dilungherò io nella presentazione di un personaggio che non ha bisogno di presentazione ma che appartiene comunque per dovere eh, di ruolo a Ugo Mattei eh, fare come introduzione di questo ospite dirò semplicemente, me lo permetterà Frizio Capra, eh, della grande gioia di averlo conosciuto questa sera per me, eh, una conoscenza peraltro in diretta che risale a 30 anni fa, più di 30 anni fa, quindi i primi anni 80, il suo Tao della fisica fu per me, ma credo anche per molti di voi, un momento illuminante di grande apertura culturale, a cui hanno fatto seguito poi Turning Point, le la rete della vita, le scienze della vita e adesso questo, questo libro che ho avuto il piacere già di leggere nei giorni scorsi, eh, di grande seduzione intellettuale che è eh, The Ecology of Law, eh, l'ecologia del diritto, eh, che apre per i giuristi abituati a vivere un po' al chiuso del, nel loro mondo accademico e nel loro pensare autoreferenziale prospettive interessantissime. Ho detto troppo, mi fermo e passo con piacere eh, la parola al all'animatore eh, e, e ispiratore dell'International eh, University College, professor Ugo Mattei, la parola. Prego. Ok, I, I will shift to English because, as we have said, this is an event mostly thought as our inauguration. Um, this is inauguration number eight, and, but the college exists since the 2006, so we, we have quite a long, a long history. We've been a very thriving little institution. Uh, we developed a body of uh, graduates and of students that uh, is exceptionally gifted and committed to transforming the world. Not, nothing less than this is the uh, task and the goal of the International University College of Turin. We really try to approach uh, the transformations and the uh, structures of global capitalism from a different perspective, for a per from a perspective that is heterodox, that is centered on a variety of of alternative visions, most of those coming and stemming from the global south. And with this dialogue in which the north, the global north, is not for once here just to teach and here just to preach, but here also to listen, to understand, and to develop ideas together, um, we believe we are doing a very small work, but a very important one because quite a number of our former students and graduates are now occupying places in which they will develop a network of people that believe and think systemically. Friti of Capra is, uh, first of all, a, a big friend of mine. And we spent uh, many, many years together uh, enjoying each other on a tennis court. Without really, without really talking much about uh, big things, but just talking about, you know, first serve, second serve, double fault, and things like that. And then, you know, after a while, we started, uh, we started talking about uh, what was around us, around this sort of circumscribed space, which is a tennis court. 
and we discovered and figured out that we had a lot of points of co in common, despite the fact that he's a scientist, he's a system theorist, and I'm just a lawyer. And the lawyers are, in a way, the underdogs of the, of the intellectuals. Uh, in every sort of uh, intellectual institutions, there is everyone else, and then there is the lawyer. Um, some years ago, a big friend of mine, and this is like an episode that we talk about also in the book, uh, The Ecology of Law, uh, a friend of mine who was a very distinguished professor of jurisprudence at Harvard University was appointed to a, a year of sabbatical in uh, a, one of those uh, centers for interdisciplinary studies in the East Coast, I believe it was in Princeton or some place like that, in which, you know, for a year or so, scholars are hosted in a very nice place just to talk and to exchange ideas and to write their own papers and books. And there would be sociologists, uh, anthropologists, linguists, uh, physicists, uh, everybody would be around there, and he was a lawyer, actually a scholar of jurisprudence. So he had a very high uh, con consideration of himself, you know, as a legal philosopher, someone talking about, you know, the big system. And, he told me, look, Ugo, I was very frustrated because whenever you'd get in the commons where all the other people were talking with each other, you'd stop talking about ideas, and each one of them would come to me and say, oh, you know, my refrigerator stopped working and I just bought it. Uh, what should I do? Or, you know, my tenant is not actually paying my rent, and should I sue him or not? And everybody was looking at me as I was like the little sort of... Uh, nitty-gritty solver of everyday problems, the kind of stuff you don't want to deal with, but you have to do it because life is actually hard, you know? There are all these, these sort of things. And he was very frustrated, and he was not perceiving himself as a real intellectual. He felt marginalized. And so I, uh, myself, as everybody who is doing law, kind of lives in that kind of a limbo, you know? We're not really social scientists. Uh, who, who are we, you know? Some lawyers say, oh, we are the scientists of the law, but it's kind of a little ridiculous, you know, this idea that the law can be a science. And, 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 and so there is a kind of an identity crisis, and so the way to go out of that is, of course, to engage in a dialogue with people that work and think in different, in different areas. And so to me, it was a big excitement to actually start working with Fritjof because we're starting together to understand that this understanding of the law and the role of the lawyers, as we understand it today, is actually itself a sort of cultural construction of an historical evolution that uh, uh, was never just always like that. There was a time in history, the beginning and the making of modernity, in which actually lawyers enjoyed a very important space and a very important role at the high table of culture. Um, they would be actually talking with philosophers and physicists and other high table intellectuals at the same level and they were working together in making modernity. Among these people there would be names that are almost completely unknown to anybody who is not a lawyer and also to most people and many ones that are actually lawyers or practicing lawyers that think that their job is to be sort of technicians of issues and problems and litigation among people. Jean Domas, for example, who was a very, very famous French jurist, was a friend of René Descartes, Cartesius, was uh, very connected with Blaise Pascal, was part of the same circle of people that were actually thinking at the time about things as uh, esoteric as separating the world of the is, the analysis, from the word of the ought to be. So the very foundation of positivism. And this guy had a role there. Other people like uh, um, Hugo Grotius, who was actually a practicing lawyer. He was uh, the jurist and the lawyer for the East Indian Company. Also he had very, very rich and powerful client. He was himself a friend of Spinoza. He was part of the circles in, uh, in uh, Amsterdam 
where they were transforming the vision of reality from something that was created by God and bestowed over people into something that the rational human beings could actually create themselves. And you know, on the side, he invented international law. And his invention of international law is still with us today. And I'm not saying he's with us today for the good, because he actually invented international law to serve the interest of the East Indian Company, which was the first uh, uh, global corporation, transnational corporation, plundering the world and doing all sorts of disasters in uh, basically extracting wealth from weaker people in the world. But you know, his ideas were part of the constructions of modernity. And this is something that is uh, very important to think systemically to look into a context to understand that lawyers are those that, together with economists, together with other social scientists, are one of the, so to say, professions that developed from a common moment that was the foundation of modernity in which science, and social science in particular, developed into a variety of different disciplines, created the discipline knowledge, and this discipline knowledge in a way precluded us to talk to each other. And in the last few 50 years or so, we are now talking about inter interdisciplinary work because it was very powerful intellectual barriers that were created by disciplines have precluded a lot of communication, okay? And, you know, I myself was always very sort of, uh, um, so to say, resistant to the idea of the disciplined knowledge and a, a, a very indisciplined person. And so I tried to work with economists in the early part of my career. I worked with anthropologists, but I never went so far as working with a scientist. And working with Fritjof was, from this point of view, an extremely challenging and important event. Fritjof became a, a world celebrity with his book of 1975, which we keep saying is 40 years ago, but in fact is almost 50 years ago, I'm sorry to report. Um, 1975, The Tao of Physics, was a book that I remember very well when I was a high school student, that it was actually one of the things that was discussed among, you know, in the sort of uh, self-organized little seminars that we used to do when we were occupying the high school. Uh, back in, in 76, 77, those kind of years, uh, was a very important book because it was a first challenge of the idea that the West could actually teach everything to the rest. That the West was the actual canon of understanding, of scientific understanding, that there was nothing that the West could learn from the rest. And in the Tao of Physics, there was a big frontal challenge in the very intimate self-portrait of the West, you know, the Western scientists. And the idea was, well, you know, maybe Western science is much more close than we think to the dance of Shiva, to other kind of understandings of reality that come from what used to be called the Far East. And they wonder far from where, you know, far from Germany, far from, uh, from uh, the core of Europe. Uh, so the Far East uh, was producing actually ideas and conceptions and structures of knowledge that were as sophisticated, perhaps more sophisticated, as some of the conceptions that we have created here in our university career. And the Tao of Physics was actually a philosophical book, and uh, Fritjof wrote it, and uh, the book was incredibly successful. Uh, he sold millions of, co it sold millions of copies. Uh, it was translated in, in you know, many, many languages, I believe in 30 languages or something like that. Um, and, and, and really kind of launched Friti of Capra as one of these sort of uh, worldly intellectuals that could have the luxury of actually thinking without really having to work and to teach and to, and to actually, you know, kind of grade exams and do the kind of things that the other intellectuals that are less successful have to do. And after the Tao of Physics, there was his uh, other very important book that was called The Turning Point, and that was, uh, we were in the early 80s, 1982. And this was another book that actually produced the first opening up of his, uh, an, uh, of his ambition, in a way, from the understanding of the inner spiritual basic forms of the human spirit into something that is, in a way, more worldly, that is the impact and the consequences 
of the mechanistic thought, on the way in which we think, in the way in which the René Descartes and Francis Bacon and all these guys have taught us to do in the uh, political, in the, in, in, in the, in the more worldly spirit, uh, areas of knowledge. And The Turning Point was another very, very important book, another very big success, another bestseller out there, in which Capra actually, uh, in a way, started to, not to abandon the scientific research, but certainly to shift and to move in a direction of what we would say today is a social, is a social scientist. After that, there was another book that is, uh, that was, uh, that is actually one of, one of my favorite, that is the system view of life, that, that is the, um, web of life. the web of life, exactly, the system view is actually the last one. Uh, the web of life uh, is, was the most systematic and I would say more theoretical uh, organization of the kind of knowledge that had, emer had emerged to that point. And then there was the parenthesis, the big parenthesis about Leonardo. So Capra became actually a got interested in seeing the roots of our, of the understanding of our system of knowledge, of our disciplined understanding of reality. And in a way, I think that his work on Leonardo is pretty similar to what we then later did with the law, because it's approaching a long evolution of knowledge and thought that has produced a way of thinking, uh, the way we think today, that is so deeply ingrained in our in our regime of, of understanding that we consider it natural and we look and we lose kind of the historical contingencies of the way we think. And in a way the Leonardo book is fascinating because Leonardo was a big uh, underdog in the narrative, in the conventional narrative of the scientific thought. He's considered of course by everybody a genius, a great, great artist, but he was not really recognized as such as important as a person as, for example, Galileo in the making of modernity and quantitative understanding of reality. He was in a way 100 years before, but he was kind of history turned away in a way that his way of looking at the reality it was very humble. You know, Leonardo was someone that was trying to learn from nature rather than trying to impose the rational understanding and quantifying forces of the human mind over nature. So it was, uh, in a way, uh, humbly looking at what we can learn from nature as opposed to trying to transform and exploit nature at our own service. And, and this is something, so he was not really a believer in trying to introduce and create formal standards of understanding and knowledge in order to transform, but was in a way in awe in understanding this incredible complexity in expressing himself through drawing through a variety of forms that would allow to, you know, uh, humans to actually enjoy the, 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 the full complexity of reality. And Capra's argument is that this vision of Leonardo was incredibly modern and incredibly coherent with what we now know from the most advanced scientific paradigms about, about the reality around us. But this guy was in a way kept outside, constructed as an artist and not as a scientist as much, and this is part of the building of modernity as, as, as a political and, and, social, and, and, social, and social project. Capra himself, in a way, these you know, very few remarks that I'm making about his work show us how much of a, uh, a Renaissance man he is, how much he was someone who was feeling unsatisfied by just spending a lot of time in the Lawrence Laboratory in, in Berkeley to do actually hard science, and he really wanted to do something more and something, something different, and he engaged in trying to look at things from a very different ways, you know, his understanding of the mind, even the ways of expression of his work were very, were very va various. There is a fabulous movie, uh, actually Capra won a very, very prestigious prize for a movie that he didn't direct it, but that he screenplayed that is called uh, The Mind Walk, uh, a movie with the great actress Liv Ullman, um, and, uh, and, um, 
and, 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 and the movie is very, very interesting, and maybe, I don't know if it's on, uh, on the YouTube by now, but it's, yes, uh, yeah, yes, I it think is. you should really kind of download it and watch it. It's a fantastic movie, very interesting and entertaining. And it's actually really pretty much a movie based on the intellectual, the intellectual, the intellectual evolution, evolution of Capra. More recently, he did two important works, one with uh, Luisi, who is actually, he likes to work with Italians, obviously. I mean, he, he, he worked with Luisi, who is an engineer from the University of Rome. And with Luisi, he was Cambridge University Press, and I think the book is, uh, is uh, in its Italian translation is available out there. He tried to explain and systematize the system vision of science, the systemic thought in the variety of areas in which it's actually contributing is a very foundational book. And from that book, actually now there is this sort of new project in which Fritjof has launched himself, which is a series of lectures that uh, I believe uh, he's, uh, maybe he will tell us something about that in his, in his talk, is a series of lectures that can be downloaded from, uh, from the internet in which he applies system thinking to a very, a very large number of areas. And, and he really tries to um, create some sort of literacy on, on eco-thinking, you know. Uh, the idea of literacy, eco-literacy, is a concept and a notion that Capra advanced. He created and founded the Center for Eco-Literacy in Berkeley with this idea that we are basically living modernity and capitalism made us very ignorant. We believe we know very much we believe knowledge accumulates, that everybody knows more than everybody before him, but in fact, in our accumulation of knowledge, we lost a lot, and, this, and, and basically we lost contact with nature, with ecological processes, with how the way in which nature sustains processes, we lost that. So for as much knowledge we accumulate, we lose also a lot of that with the result that our kids today, especially those that live in the cities, have no idea of nature, no idea of how nature operates, have no contact with the physical reality of our life, have been alienated completely from, from the reality. And eco-literacy, according to Capra, is the most important thing we should learn and teach to our students and to our children, because without that, our behaviors are gonna be uh, certainly gonna uh, and sustainable and 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 incapable of transforming and shifting our path away from the very disastrous direction that is the, it it has taken us and you know very much how hard are the times from the ecological sustainability uh, this particular day so he founded the center for eco literacy uh, these people do a lot of very interesting work including you know, creating small gardens for children in schools to make the children actually understand and have a hand-on context and relationship with nature. And this notion of eco-literacy, we tried in the book in the College of Law to make it part of this idea of the eco-legal understanding, the idea that as uh, we have kind of alienated our relationship with the law, we kind of think that the law belongs to lawyers, belongs to professionals, and we lost sight on the idea that the law is a very important common, is actually the tool that we have as a society to reach results, to try to create justice, to try to create you know, a better and more humane society than the one we are, we are living in. And in a way, this is the approach to the, to the law and to the institution that we try to, try to teach. At, at the IUC. So to, to this evening, Capra, and they've been very, very long, and uh, this is like uh, something that I, but, but, but I think it was, I, I needed to put uh, in the context is the, is the thought of a very complex thinker. Um, I, tonight, Capra is gonna talk about, uh, I, uh, about a system view of life and about you know, his, more recent, his more recent intellectual endeavors. And uh, so without further ado, Thank you very Thank much, Fritio, for being with us, and uh, you, you have the floor. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Hugo, first of all, for inviting me here, and uh, it's great to be back in Torino. And uh, it's wonderful whenever I come to Italy and give a lecture, it's always in a beautiful palace. <laughs> I just love it. 
Uh, well, so thank you for this very kind introduction, Ugo. Um, you have given about half of my lecture already. <laughs> so I will just add a few points. Well, during these long years of research of the uh, change of paradigms from a mechanistic worldview to a holistic and ecological view, I became increasingly aware that this systemic or ecological paradigm is crucial for solving our environmental problems. Today, it is evident that concern with the environment is no longer one of many isolated issues. It's the context of everything else, of our lives, our business, businesses, our politics. As you know, the great challenge of our time is to build and nurture sustainable communities. That is, social, cultural, and physical environments in which we can satisfy our needs and aspirations without diminishing the chances of future generations. Now, since its introduction in the early 1980s, this concept of sustainability has often been misused, uh, co-opted, and even trivialized by being used without the proper ecological context that gives it meaning. So I think it is worthwhile to reflect for a moment what sustainability really means. What is sustained in a sustainable community is not economic growth or competitive advantage or anything like that. What is sustained is the very web of life on which our long-term survival depends. In other words, a sustainable community must be designed in such a way that its ways of life, businesses, economy, physical structures and social institutions do not interfere with nature's inherent ability to sustain life. That's the central point. Nature has sustained life for billions of years and we must not interfere with these processes. And if we take this seriously, then the first step naturally needs to be to understand how nature sustains life, needs to be to become ecologically literate. It turns out that this involves understanding the principles of organization that are common to all living systems. In other words, a systemic and ecological understanding of life. And indeed, such a new understanding of life has emerged in science over the last 30 years or so. And this is the conceptual framework that I have been working on uh, over the last 30, 40 years, ever since I wrote the Tao of Physics. And the uh, synthesis, the, the, I wouldn't say ultimate, but for me personally, the definitive synthesis of this new understanding of life is now published in the textbook I wrote with my colleague Pierluigi Luisi, and it is called The Systems View of Life. Uh, the Italian edition is called Vita e Natura. And um, in this book, we give an overview over this new systemic understanding of life, integrating four of life's dimensions. The biological dimension, the cognitive, the social and the ecological dimension. Just to give you a brief summary, at the forefront of contemporary science, the universe is no longer seen as a machine composed of some elementary building blocks. We have discovered that the material world ultimately is an inseparable network of relationships. We have also discovered that the planet as a whole is a living self-regulating system. That's the celebrated Gaia theory. 
The view of the human body as a machine and of the mind as a separate entity is now being replaced by one that sees not only the brain, but also the immune system, uh, the bodily tissues, and in fact, every single cell as a living cognitive system. Evolution is no longer seen as a competitive struggle for existence, but rather as some kind of cooperative dance in which creativity and the constant emergence of novelty are the driving forces. And with the new emphasis on complexity, networks and patterns of organization, a new science of qualities is now slowly emerging. And we call this new science the systems view of life because it involves a new kind of thinking, thinking in terms of relationships, in terms of context, in terms of processes, and this is known in science as systems thinking or systemic thinking. Now, thinking in terms of relationships is crucial for ecology because ecology, and you may know that the term comes from the Greek oikos, meaning household, ecology is the science of the relationships among the various members of the earth household. I should also mention that systemic thinking is not limited to science. Many indigenous cultures embody profound ecological awareness and think of nature in terms of relationships and patterns. And the same is true, for example, in traditional Chinese philosophy and in many Eastern spiritual traditions. And this is what I explored in my first book, The Tao of Physics. And as Ugo mentioned, during the last 10 years, I've also been fascinated by the science of Leonardo da Vinci, which was a science of living forms. Leonardo lived 100 years before Galileo, and single-handedly uh, developed uh, an empirical method with all the characteristics that are now known as the scientific method. But his science was not a mechanistic science. It was a science of living forms of interconnected patterns and processes. So I wrote two books about Leonardo's science. The first one is called The Science of Leonardo, and in Italian, it's called, uh, it is called uh, La Scienza, what is it called? Universale. Universale. La Scienza Universale. And uh, the second one is called Learning from Leonardo, and it's called L'Anima di Leonardo. Uh, in the second book, I go into all the depth of Leonardo's science of his hydrodynamics, the science of flight, his medicine, geology, botany, and so on. And uh, when, when I published the book, it was actually first published in Italy, my publisher at Rizzoli said, Fritjof, this is a very complicated book, and we, won't, we shouldn't scare the readers, so let's give it a simple title, let's call it L'Anima di Leonardo. <laughs> That's how it got the title. Well, anyway, back to modern science. Uh, systems thinking emerged in the 1920s from a series of interdisciplinary dialogues among biologists, psychologists, and ecologists. And in all these fields, scientists realized that a living system, an organism, an ecosystem or a social system is an integrated whole whose parts cannot, whose properties cannot be reduced to those of its smaller parts. So uh, there are systemic properties of the whole which none of the parts have. 
Let me just give you a very simple example from actually a non-living system. And the example is sugar. You all know that sugar tastes sweet. Well, if you want to ask why does it taste sweet, sweet you might think, well, let's do some chemistry and see what's at the bottom of this. Sugar is a compound consisting of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. The carbon doesn't taste sweet, the oxygen doesn't taste sweet, and the hydrogen doesn't taste sweet. So where does the sweetness come from? It comes from the pattern of connectedness of these elements or atoms. So it lies in the relationships of, of the parts. And so the systemic properties are always properties of the whole. The early systems thinkers uh, used this now well-known phrase, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Now, system science also tells us that all living systems have a set of common properties and principles of organization. And this means that systems thinking can be applied to integrate academic disciplines and to discover similarities between different phenomena within the broad range of living systems. And so it can be used to overcome the fragmentation of academic disciplines. And I'm uh, very happy to uh, know that you know, one of the universities that does that very well is right here in, in Torino. The Politecnico in Torino has a study program, a master's program of whole systems design, and they really integrate all these disciplines. And of course, the UK also uh, does that. So I think Torino is sort of academically, at least, at the forefront of, of this movement. Well, during the 1970s and 1980s, systems thinking was raised to a new level with the development of complexity theory, technically known as nonlinear dynamics. This is a new mathematical language that allows scientists for the first time to handle the enormous complexity of living systems mathematically. Chaos theory is part of this complexity theory. Fractal geometry is another important branch. And this nonlinear, new nonlinear mathematics is essentially a mathematics of patterns, a mathematics of relationships. So you may have heard of strange attractors and of fractals. These are geometric patterns that are visual representations of the system's complex dynamics. So this complexity theory has uh, started a strong interest uh, from a, about 1980 on, a strong interest in nonlinear phenomena, and this has generated a whole series of new and powerful theories that have dramatically increased our understanding of many key characteristics of life. And my synthesis of these theories is what I call the system's view of life. Now, to present it properly would take a whole course, and actually this is the idea behind my internet course, which, as uh, Ugo mentioned, is structured in 12 lectures and based on the textbook the system's view of life. And uh, it's an online course that people from all over the world can take. Uh, we offer one lecture a week in a certain period. And uh, the, the name of the course is easy to remember. It's Capra Course. And uh, the website is capracourse.net. And if you look it up on the website, you can see a trailer that shows you um, I'm giving these lectures in front of a small group, and it's very lively, and so just check it out. You might be interested. Well, uh, let me give you a few highlights of this new systems view of life. One of the most important insights 
is, has been the recognition that networks are the basic pattern of organization of all living systems. Ecosystems are understood in terms of food webs, that is, networks of organisms. Organisms are networks of cells. Cells are networks of molecules. And then, of course, we have social networks that are networks of communications. So the network is a pattern common to all life. Wherever we see life, we see networks. And indeed, at the very heart of this change of paradigms from the mechanistic to the systemic view is a fundamental change of metaphors from seeing the world as a machine to understanding it as a network. Well, these living networks have been studied very closely over the last 30 years or so. And these studies have shown that their central characteristic is that they are self-generating. In a cell, for example, all the cellular structures, the proteins, including the enzymes, the DNA, the membranes, and so on, all this is built up by the cellular network. All these parts are generated, repaired, and, and uh, kept functioning and continually renewed by the metabolic network of the cell. Similarly, at the level of a multicellular organism, the bodily cells are continually regenerated and recycled by the organism's cellular network. So living systems continually create or recreate themselves by transforming or replacing their components. And in this way, they undergo continual structural changes while preserving their web-like patterns of organization. And indeed, this coexistence of stability and change, and change is a key characteristic of life. Now, I want to emphasize that my synthesis of the system's view of life is not only theory, but has very concrete applications. In the last part of our book, which is titled Sustaining the Web of Life, I discuss the criti critical importance of the system's view of life for dealing with the problems of our multifaceted global crisis. Today, it is becoming ever more apparent that none of our major problems, energy, environment, climate change, poverty, violence and war, and so on, none of these problems can be understood in isolation. They are systemic problems, which means that they are all interconnected and interdependent. And interestingly, one person who has recognized this very clearly is not a scientist nor a philosopher, but is our current pope. I never thought that I would quote the pope in a lecture, but I, I am, because this new encyclical, uh, Laudato Si, is an ecological encyclical in which the pope really shows himself as a truly systemic thinker. Here's what he writes. Our common home is falling into serious disrepair, and he uses the term home in the Greek sense of oikos, from which ecology comes. This is evident in large-scale natural disasters, as well as social and even financial crises. For the world's problems cannot be analyzed or explained in isolation. It cannot be emphasized enough how everything is interconnected. When this encyclical came out, my friend Luisi called me from Rome and said, guess what, the Pope has read our book, <laughs> because it's so similar. <clears throat> now, systemic problems require corresponding systemic solutions, solutions that do not solve any problem in isolation, but deal with it within the context of other problems. Systemic solutions, therefore, 
tend to solve several problems simultaneously. Let me give you one example from agriculture. If we changed from our chemical, large-scale, mechanized industrial agriculture to organic, community-oriented, sustainable farming, also known as agroecology, this would contribute significantly to solving three of our major problems. First, it would greatly reduce our energy dependence because we are now using, at least in the United States, one-fifth of our fossil fuels to grow and process food. Secondly, the healthy, organically grown food would have a huge positive effect on public health because many chronic diseases, heart disease, strokes, diabetes, and so on, are directly linked to our diet. And finally, and this is not generally appreciated, organic farming would contribute significantly to fighting climate change because an organic soil is a living soil and carbon is the chemical backbone of life. And so an organic soil draws down carbon from the atmosphere and locks it up in organic matter. <clears throat> so you see, agroecology is a systemic solution par excellence. Over the last few decades, the research institutes of the global civil society have developed and tested hundreds of such systemic solutions. And in our book, we dedicate about 60 pages to detailed discussions of effective systemic solutions of our global crisis. Well, to conclude, I want to mention that in all these discussions of systemic problems and systemic solutions, something important is missing. And that is the legal dimension. And this is what I learned when I met Hugo Mattei and engaged in dialogues with him over the years. I suddenly had to realize that not only myself, but many other authors who write books about the paradigm shift and about how to change the world, people like Naomi Klein or uh, Bill McKibben or uh, Amory Lovins or Hazel Henderson, there are, you know, a good dozen of authors who are colleagues of mine and write about similar issues and none of us uh, noticed that the legal dimension was missing. It was an important thing in, in this, these considerations. Now, as Ugo mentioned, when people think about law, they usually think about lawyers and their cases. The Ecology of Law, the book that we wrote together, is the first book <clears throat> to present jurisprudence, the theory and philosophy of law, as an intellectual discipline with a history and conceptual structure that shows surprising par parallels to those of natural science. What we discovered in our conversations over many years was that the two disciplines have interacted through history and quite often famous scientists were also famous jurists. And so the two disciplines co-evolved over time and so did the conceptual relationship between laws of nature and human laws. And the other thing that I learned from Mattei is the jurisprudence together with science, has contributed significantly to the mechanistic modern worldview, <coughs> and since modernity produced the materialistic orientation and extractive mentality of the industrial age, which lies at the root of our global crisis, both scientists and jurists must share some responsibility for the current state of the world. Now, let me very briefly <coughs> identify the main characteristics of the mechanistic paradigm. 
in science, it includes an emphasis on quantification advocated by Galileo <coughs> and on the human domination of nature championed by Francis Bacon, who was famous as a scientist and a lawyer. It centrally includes the view of the material world as a machine, postulated by Descartes. The concept of unchangeable laws of nature, <coughs> established by Isaac Newton, who also was a scientist and a judge. And it includes the rationalist, atomistic view of society promoted by John Locke. A corresponding mechanistic paradigm was formulated in jurisprudence by Hugo Grotius, whom uh, Hugo already mentioned, a Dutch lawyer and contemporary of Descartes, and by Jean Domas, also mentioned already, one of the most influential French jurists and lifelong friend of Pascal. Pascal, by the way, that other genius of the uh, scientific revolution in France, was educated by his father. His father was a mathematician and a judge. So you see, in those days, really, jurisprudence and science went hand in hand. They were closely interlinked. Now, in the mechanistic legal paradigm, social reality is viewed as an aggregate of discrete individuals, and ownership as an individual right protected by the state. And indeed, ownership and state sovereignty are the two organizing principles of what is called legal modernity or legal absolutism. And finally, the view of law as an objective framework, rather than being tentative and approximate, is also an integral part of the mechanistic legal paradigm. Now, as I have mentioned, my own work over the last 40 years has been to explore and discuss a radically new paradigm that is now emerging at the forefront of science. And a corresponding paradigm shift has not yet happened in jurisprudence, nor in the public conception of law but it is now urgently needed, and that's really the motivation behind our book, The Ecology of Law, we call for a profound change of legal paradigms leading to what we call an eco-legal order in the world. Well, let me close with this, and I hope there's some time for discussion, and I very much look forward to that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, actually, I have some slides, and uh, can you please open that? Yeah. Uh, can you press the Enter key on the keyboard? Enter key, because the title is not here. Yeah, OK, thank you. Uh, OK, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, say thank you to uh, the organizers of this conference. Uh, because it's really uh, quite an honor to be uh, here in front of all these uh, great professors and uh, respected students. Uh, having said this, uh, basically after uh, reading The Ecology of Law, uh, which is like in a book recently published by Professor Ugo Mate and <coughs> Professor Capra, uh, I decided to basically present on uh, the TTP, which is uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, uh, at least, you know, because uh, I believe that, okay, right now trade agreements are basically serving or as a means or as a weapon for this uh, uh, advancing, as a weapon of like advancing the uh, extractive uh, or this exp exploitative mentalities or uh, mindsets. So because of this one, I personally like, you know, would like to talk in maybe 10 to 15 minutes on uh, this TTP or uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Uh, Basically, the title which I chose for this presentation uh, is uh, 
uh, whether TTP is a uh, tired expression or it is a vivacious agreement. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, the, I'd like to follow this kind of uh, outline, and first I'd like to uh, briefly talk on the concept of TTP, what does it mean, uh, and then I'd immediately proceed. I'll uh, immediately uh, proceed to uh, basically like uh, briefly talk on uh, how proponents of uh, this trade agreement basically perceive it. And then uh, I'll continue to uh, like to uh, critically observe and critically like you know, or reflect my own personal uh, observation on this uh, agreement. Uh, while basically talking on this agreement, uh, personally, I'd like to uh, depend on this investment agreement, so investment chapter of uh, this agreement. And finally, I'd like to conclude uh, by saying whether it is like you know, uh, the uh, replica of basically what we are tired of or whether it is like, you know, uh, uh, whether it has something uh, called vivacious uh, kind of agreement. Uh, so having said this, let me proceed directly to uh, TTP. So, what's TTP? Uh, basically, uh, it's a massive or uh, mega free uh, trade agreement, which is basically recently signed. I think most of you have heard about this agreement. Uh, this basically, this agreement is uh, intended in order to set or in order to create a new rules, basically that uh, serve as a base for uh, like an even other other uh, future, I mean, other countries that intend to join this uh, this club. Basically, this uh, uh, TTP, uh, which is a trade agreement, is basically signed uh, among 12 countries, which is, uh, these countries basically exist uh, on both sides of the Pacific Rim. Uh, five of them are from, as you can see, from Americas, which, and five of them are from uh, Asia, and two of them are from, uh, I mean, New Zealand and Australia. Uh, overall, these countries basically uh, represent 40% of uh, the global economy, uh, the major is in terms of GDP and 30% of uh, global exports and 25% of what we call it this uh, uh, global imports. Well, uh, the issue is that even though uh, this uh, TTP is a massive and a massive uh, and mega free uh, trade, I mean free uh, trade agreement, however, uh, if you see the process of negotiation of this agreement, basically the, during the process of uh, negotiation, uh, the public basically didn't have access to this draft text of uh, this agreement. Uh, the irony is that even though the public didn't have access to uh, this, I mean, draft text, but uh, the issue is, I mean, the irony is that uh, more than, especially in the United States of America, more than 600 official uh, corporate basically lobbyists have uh, had, I mean, access to the draft text of uh, this, uh, this agreement. Uh, and uh, imagine these uh, official lobbyists or these corporate lobbyists uh, basically are like you know, companies that have been engaged in, uh, in instituting cases or uh, uh, that are companies that are engaged actually in instituting cases uh, even against uh, states. These companies, for example, like companies, multinational companies such as Chevron uh, had access to this draft, draft text, whereas like, you know, uh, basically the broader society have been devoid of uh, even accessing uh, this trade uh, agreement or the draft agreement. Well, having said this, even though uh, the trade agreement is basically intending to create uh, as basically opponents, I mean proponents of this agreement say, uh, I'm sorry, uh, okay. Uh, even though uh, this trade agreement, as opponents of, I mean, proponents of this agreement basically say, even though it serves as like a you know, docking agreement, docking in a sense, an open agreement in which it also like leaves places for other, uh, I mean, future uh, countries. Uh, however, the issue is that it intends to set a kind of precedent in which, like, you know, other countries who uh, are anticipating to join. Ah, okay. Too fast, and also you should really try to make it uh, more coherent with what we are talking about generally. Yeah, that, I'm okay. coming to that so point, okay. Make an effort to be very okay. Thank you. Okay, so let me directly uh, continue in order to... Okay, uh, first let me come to the issue of uh, proponents of this agreement. Proponents of this agreement basically uh, like try to advance or try to promote this issue uh, in light of... Uh, the benefit, actually, they say the benefit it provides. Uh, they explain this benefit in light of, for example, proponents say this provides or like enforces labor rights. Uh, 
Uh, even though they say, for me, uh, this is a kind of like a flimsy argument because uh, they say that it provides, uh, I mean, or it enforces labor rights, but it's not true because uh, this kind of argument basically comes or emerges out of a failure to understand the nature or the character of what we call these multinational companies. Because uh, these multinational companies, basically, uh, they are informally talking. They are more of like, you know, uh, I can say stateless in the sense that they uh, basically jump from one jurisdiction to the other if regulation is uh, stringent. So a lot of this one, even though like proponents of this, are, uh, uh, I mean, trade agreements say that it provides uh, labor, uh, I mean, it provides or it enforces labor rights, but it's not really uh, as such because of basically like a you know, failure to understand the nature of or character of this agreement. And the other one is uh, they also promote in light of the environmental impact or the environmental like, you know, protection it provides. They say that this agreement basically provides, they say uh, that it provides strong environmental protection, but this is not true. I'll come to this point in the next slide. Uh, well, as I said, uh, even though they try to advertise or promote this agreement in light of what we call it this, uh, the uh, uh, labor uh, right it, it enforces or in light of the environmental protection it provides. However, some like you know, officials, especially uh, from the side of United States of America, they want to basically advertise this agreement in light of uh, geopolitical benefit it provides or in terms of uh, geopolitical uh, uh, merit it, it basically provides for countries. For example, this one, I took this one, uh, this is a statement from uh, uh, Washington Post, which is posted on 14th of June 2015. Uh, this is a statement by uh, Larry Summers, uh, and he said that failing to sign the TTP uh, would signal lack of U.S. commitment to Asia at a time when China is flexing its muscles. So when you see this statement, basically, uh, they promote or advertise this agreement in light of uh, the geopolitical benefit it provides for, for signatory states. But the issue is that, uh, uh, but the issue is that it doesn't provide this kind of, uh, I mean, benefit. Well, having said this, uh, let me directly proceed to, uh, let me directly proceed to uh, what's the DNA of this agreement, if you say that. Personally, I believe that this agreement doesn't enforce, doesn't enforce labor rights, doesn't have a strong environmental protection. If this is the idea, then what's really the DNA of this agreement? It's very important to see this one. So the issue is that basically when you see the preamble of this agreement, the preamble of this agreement says that one of the aims of this agreement is to provide what we call the social benefits. But the issue is, is it really, I mean, is it really this, uh, is it, I mean, providing this kind of social benefits? So in order to see whether it provides social benefits or not, it's very important to see some of the provisions of this. Thank you, thank you very much. It's really, really good, and uh, I believe uh, it's very important to look at the free trade agreement within the broader framework as you're, you're trying to do. But uh, this is probably a little bit too technical for uh, this, uh, this, the, this kind of discussion. So I suggest that first we open the floor for uh, further comments, and then maybe you can uh, you, 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 you can you can come back uh, in uh, through, through the discussion because otherwise this is getting okay, okay. very is getting yeah, sure, very sure. very technical sure, and okay. people cannot really can really follow it. Thank you very much, Zelek. Okay. And uh, so now the, the floor the floor is open. Who is, is there? Is there are there questions notes? Um, Italian or in, in Italian English. Or English, of course, uh, that uh, can. Or in German. Or in German. <laughs> <laughs> Why not in French? Yeah. Prego. Um, I have uh, I have actually um, read the Ecology of Law, and it's a book I found um, very fascinating, and it brought up some provocative questions for me. And there was one that is relatively simple, but that I sometimes struggle to square with, um, with the overall view that the book propounds. Namely, um, so the, the move from a mechanistic to an ecological worldview entails a move from laws of nature to patterns, supposedly. What, what I'm not clear about is, are patterns closed formulations of reality that supplant laws in just being more complex or are they stations to something new? I mean, where is the creativity in the concept of, of pattern? How is that different from law? And how does that 
entail a shift from a mechanistic to an ecological mindset? Well, this, this whole question of uh, loss of nature is a really very interesting question, and we discuss this in our book. Uh, it's interesting because uh, before the 17th century, uh, the term loss of nature was not used, or not used very much. What is meant by it is uh, a certain a law of nature would be a certain regu regularity that we can observe in natural phenomena and which can be expressed in a concise form and sometimes in but not always in a mathematical equation and before the 17th century these regularities were called axioms or principles, or maxims, and people had all kinds of, of uh, terms, and uh, they were called laws of nature in the 17th century. This, this habit began in Britain, in England, where with the foundation of the uh, Royal Society. The purpose of the Royal Society was to promote science and they meant Newtonian mechanistic science. And these scientists were attacked by the church for being atheist because the church said, well, you are just talking about the world as a machine and there's no room for God and it's atheistic and therefore, uh, you know, it's heretic. And so this was a big threat to the scientists. And so they said, no, no, no. We are just discovering the laws of nature which are the laws of God. And they made this parallel just as we formulate human laws so God has formulated laws that all nature has to obey, all matter obeys. And of course, it's philosophically uh, very difficult to imagine matter obeying a law. And uh, there were a lot of issues with that. But nevertheless, for political reasons, they adopted this term laws of nature. Now, across the the English Channel in France, they also had a royal society, an equivalent, and it was called Académie des Sciences or something like that, and they had no problem because for some cultural reason they were not attacked by the church. So they did not use the term laws of nature, and it was only when Newton wrote his famous Principia the, the principles of, of natural philosophy where he formulated these axioms in terms of the law of gravity and Newton's first law of motion, Newton's second law of motion. He had such an authority that the term law of nature then became widely used. But it is nothing else but certain patterns that you can observe. That's, that's what it is. And interestingly also, in the 20th century, uh, scientists became aware of the approximate nature of all scientific theories and models. And at that point, from that point on, nobody used laws of nature anymore, except in a historical context. We still talk about Newton's law of gravitation. But, for example, Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared is not called a law. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle is not called a law. Various, you know, theories of evolution are not called laws. So uh, it's, it's largely a convention of what you call the law, what you don't call the law in science. Someone else, qualcun altro? Posso permettermi di fare a, a Fritio Capra una, una curiosa osservazione, siccome è europeo come noi, 
credo anche di passaporto. Sì, sì, e, austriaco. E c'è una parte del pensiero giuridico che oggi, come sentite, è messo fortemente in discussione europeo, che è quella collegata soprattutto alla Francia, che è un po' in ombra in tutto il, il vostro lavoro. E poi c'è stato un, un giurista francese, non di, di secondo piano, il barone Montesquieu, che nel suo Esprit des Lois indica il fondamento della natura del diritto dalla nature des choses. E eh, credo che sia stato non soltanto uno dei pensatori più geniali, ma anche di uno dei più traditi poi dal seguito della tradizione giuridica francese che ha messo con, con la rivoluzione, con la codicistica napoleonica, poi una, una pietra pesante su questa vivacità del diritto. Parlava di clima, studiava il clima e i suoi influssi sul sulla formazione stessa del diritto il barone Montesquieu eh, credo che ci sia oggi una, un grosso disagio almeno se ci sono in sala come credo eh, dei, degli studiosi del diritto dei cultori del diritto lo avvertano qui è stato demolito tutto l'impianto del, del nostro sapere quello che ci hanno eh, insegnato nell'università la gerarchia del diritto eh, le fonti Fonte è un termine tra l'altro naturale, come tante altre metafore del diritto, ma tutta la, la gerarchia, l'impianto stesso meccanico del diritto che ci è stato insegnato è scosso dalle fondamenta. Allora c'è da rialfabetizzare, eh, c'è un lavoro di literacy da fare per tutti i giuristi. Siamo di fronte a una, a una fase esiziale, finale per eh, i giuristi oppure come diceva partendo appunto dalla constatazione di una certa frustrazione del diritto. Eh, C'è una, una grande prospettiva che si apre oggi per chi eh, lavora con, i, con questi ferri, magari un po' usati, un po' consumati, ma che possono eh, e devono tornare utili. C'è poi un'ultima considerazione che vorrei fare ed è che eh, il diritto, come esce dalle ultime pagine del vostro libro, non è più insegnato dall'alto, si costruisce ormai sì. in rete, quindi c'è un un cambio di pelle, c'è cioè un cambio di mentalità completo da fare da parte dei giuristi. Sì, io, io penso che questa sia uh, la parte più uh, vivente, più dinamica di, del nostro libro. E, e io vorrei che Ugo dicesse qualcosa sopra perché è veramente importante. E noi lì abbiamo cercato di ricostruire alcuni tratti attraverso i quali il diritto può liberarsi da quelle che sono le gabbie della modernità. The cages of modernity, means to say uh, property ownership, freedom of contract, fault liability, state sovereignty, these are all concepts whose purpose and function was to transform commons into capital, uh, where to take a society that was diffused and based on use value and transform that into exchange value. And we needed institutions to do that and we were very successful in doing that. Um, today, we have an opposite need. We need to transform back some capital into commons We have to go in the opposite direction, and yet we are stuck with institutional settings that we developed in the moment in which the purpose was another one. Um, and so, how to do that? How to unmake the, this extremely powerful uh, structure and artifact that was the construction of the law of modernity, and that cannot be done just in a professional way, but has to be done with the real needs of the people, the real uh, desires, the real ideas of how society should be. And this is why experimentation should be from the bottom up, and uh, it's today at a very hatching stage, but it is already producing a number of institutional settings that can be explored, whose principles can be understood, and that might become 
patterns and models for the development of a legal system that is more in tune with nature and community, as the subtitle of our books is trying to say. So clearly, the transformation of a legal system from a top-down institutional machine of imposition of political power into the people into something that is a tool of the people that as a common use it requires uh, quite a lot of work from the lawyer's point of view, but also a lot of work of people as activists, of social movements, of people that are willing to challenge the status quo to try to suggest something, something different. So it cannot be just an abstract description of how the law is, but should be something that describes what is actually happening in society in the, in, the, in the flesh and blood of the human relationship. Now, Ugo, in, in our book you mentioned and, and discussed a lot of these examples, like uh, Teatro de la Valle in Rome, or the Eau de Paris, and, and various, uh, various campaigns and, and projects of this kind. Has there been any effort to network them so that they become aware of one another and become a political force? Yeah, uh, it's not easy because, you see, the, the, these ones that I'm talking about, and there are a few that are very well known, and those are connected with each other. For example, our friend Vedran here is actually in the business of doing that in terms of trying to map and organize these movements. The point is that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little kind of NIMBY experiences, you know, people that experience the fact that uh, the capital is actually uh, precluding their capacity to live a normal life and, and, and decide to react and to resist. And those are hundreds and some are very well known. The Teatro Val would be one and there are, you know, in many uh, European settings, there are a few paradigmatic struggles that kind of emerge and become known, but there are hundreds of others that are not. And this work is, of course, uh, in the process of being done. Like, for example, last week in Susa, uh, there was uh, a meeting in which a number of the Italians one were together. So these things are happening, but we're not, we're not uh, anyway near to have uh, an actual uh, real network that is in some way organized. It's very difficult to organize this kind of thing. But maybe this could be something for one of your graduate students as a thesis. Don't you think that could be a project? Yeah, for, I don't know whether it's enough to so one person. It seems to me that is, uh, yeah, but it's a project to be entertained. I, yeah. I, totally, I totally agree. Okay, in the back there's... Wondering, I was wondering if you um, put um, the affective, affectivity in uh, your uh, system, no? Because you are speaking about uh, systematic, uh, uh, systemic problems yeah. and uh, systemic um, um, solutions, uh, and about the bio, the psycho, and the social. But uh, what about the psycho? What about relationship uh, between people? What is your idea, I was thinking, uh, about the new uh, way to stay together? Is clear? Well, uh, you know, obviously, in the time here, I could give you only a very, very brief summary, just some highlights. But in the book Vita and Natura, we, we talk a lot about that too. Uh, and, and there, are, um, there are two uh, aspects. First, when you talk about the system's view of life, when you talk about the social domain, then you talk about social networks, which are networks of communication. And, and human communication is always, uh, you know, rational and emotional and cultural. So it's it's a very complex dance. So that's, that's one aspect. The other aspect in, in the chapter on mind and consciousness, we talk about uh, recent theories of consciousness that say that emotions are critical in the formation of consciousness. You can't have any thought 
that is not emotional. Purely rational thought does not exist. It's always emotional. And this is especially emphasized by Antonio Damasio in his theory of consciousness. So we talk about that too. So there's, there's a lot about affectivity and, and emotion. Okay, uh, just a small question. Uh, when you said that we should try to understand everything uh, with systems, and then as an example you gave the example of cell, and that cell, cell as a system has a way of it repro reproducing preservation. So uh, how would you say well, when we live in a world in which is on the verge of self-destruction and we should understand it through a systems theory and systems imply the function of preservation, why are we living in a world that's on the verge and has a possibility to self-destruct? How the system's concept of system as something that self-preserves can be applied to a world that has a possibility to self-destruct that we live in now? Yeah. Well, this is, um, this is a very deep question. And I believe that it is related to the nature of human consciousness. Human consciousness uh, has the uh, ability to reflect, to think, and to abstract. Uh, the very nature of reflective consciousness, the very nature of language which comes with it, is the ability to abstract uh, from what we experience and what we observe. You know, words are abstractions, ideas are abstractions. And uh, this ability of abstraction has led to the great achievements of humanity. This has led to uh, you know, Beethoven's Fifth Sym Symphony or the, the Chola Bronzes of Dancing Shivas or, or Einstein's Theory of Relativity. Those are all tremendous achievements of humanity that would not be possible without the ability of abstraction. But on the other hand, the ability of abstraction has a shadow side. And it is that we tend to abstract ourselves sort of out of nature, to see ourselves as isolated egos within a skin, separate from nature. And, and that is the reason for many of our problems. And if we did not have this reflective consciousness, uh, we would certainly not destroy ourselves. We would just, we wouldn't have a choice. We would just act like the rest of nature acts. But consciousness gives us the possibility to act against the laws of nature, so to speak. And it's our, uh, our duty to uh, reconnect again with nature, to go beyond this abstraction and reconnect again with nature. Also, so that Capital really forces us to do that. There are imperatives of the institutional structures that produces, no matter what the consciousness is, a sort of coactive force to go in the direction of destruction, which is, you know, keeping on transforming uh, commons and common poor resources into more abstract capital that itself is producing more of that and less of, you know, the sort of more necessary uh, conditions of life. Yeah. All right. Maybe the last one. Buonasera, io in insegno, non sono una esperta di giurisprudenza, ma insegno una cosa che si chiama interdisciplinarità della gastronomia. Allora, eh, sì, al, della gastronomia all'Università di Scienze Gastronomiche e quindi ci troviamo sempre un po' ad ondolare con i miei studenti tra ehm, arrivare al punto e dire benissimo c'è un, un problema di, ri, di ripensamento del quadro giuridico oppure c'è un problema di ripensamento del quadro economico e, e siamo sempre lì in mezzo perché poi tutte, tutte le varie catene portano a un certo punto o a una legge che va modificata o che va inventata, 
o che comunque va infranta eh, temporaneamente fino a quando non c'è quella nuova, eh, oppure ad un sistema economico che si sta modificando, che sta mostrando la corda, quello dominante, però non c'è ancora quello nuovo pronto, ce ne sono tanti nuovi che, che si sperimentano. E, quello che mi viene da pensare ascoltandovi è che il sistema giuridico, essendo basato su dei testi scritti, eh, ha la stessa scarsità di elasticità che può avere un, una religione, una, una grande religione del libro, insomma. E il fatto di avere dei testi scritti che ovviamente si, sono molto meno dinamici della vita, che cambia più in fretta, che cambia più facilmente, e richiedono un, forse un, un passaggio, una transizione per una fase non scritta, per una fase non scritta che però forse diventa anche illegale e allora ehm, tutta la parte di rischio no? che si possono assumere quelli che fanno delle buone pratiche in altri ambiti perché comunque fai, fai, fai delle buone pratiche in ambito produttivo, in ambito economico, però in un quadro giuridico di riferimento che ti permette di non andare in galera mentre fai le buone pratiche di sperimentazione. Ma se sperimenti nuovi sistemi giuridici rischi di più in qualche maniera e poi non hai i riferimenti. Allora questa era un, una prima domanda, si può passare attraverso un sistema, una fase giuridica non scritta che ci può aiutare ad andare verso un nuovo sistema giuridico, che è un, un po' quello che sta succedendo con tutto il pensamento sui beni comuni, che mancano ancora di un, di un riferimento giuridico preciso, però anche mancano di un'applicazione pratica che ci piaccia sempre. Ehm, e allora, ecco, provavo a, a pensare, mentre, mi, mentre riesco a immaginare una fase di transizione verso, nuove, verso nuovi sistemi eco, economici che e quella che stiamo vivendo di fatto, ehm, quello che forse rallenta eh, la costruzione di nuovi sistemi giuridici è proprio il fatto che chi si mette a costruirli è completamente senza barriere, senza protezioni. Uh, let me add something to this, and that is, uh, let me tell you how things are done in science. Uh, in science, the results are not written down right away. In fact, the results are achieved through continuous discussion and dialogue. When, when scientists meet at a conference or in, in departments, they spend hours and hours of you know, presenting ideas and questioning ideas and contradicting each other, and even the scientific papers that are published are seen by everybody as temporary. And as soon as you know, some team publishes a paper about something, another team will either contradict it or try to, to reproduce it. And it's only after a long process of dialogue and slowly emerging consensus that a scientific theory will be written down in a textbook as a theory. And even then, it can be always questioned. So I don't know how this looks, uh, you know, from the, uh, from the point of view of law. Sì. Uh mi permetto di aggiungere che noi siamo tutti un po' vittima eh, di due secoli legistici che ci hanno fissato nell'idea che eh, la legge astratta, scritta, eh, votata secondo determinati crismi sia l'unica fonte del diritto e infatti nel nostro codice civile nelle preleggi ancora è messo la, co il cos la consuetudine, la coutume è messa in fondo l'ultima, proprio quando non si sa a che cosa fa riferimento in realtà da questo libro emerge la rivoluzione anche delle fonti perché il, la, la, la consuetudine sta diventando dal diritto commerciale internazionale eh, in moltissime forme del diritto una forma risorgente fortissima altri popoli non l'hanno mai abbandonata la palabra eh, in Africa è sempre rimasta un modo di soluzione delle questioni giuridiche così eh, nel mondo noi siamo solo una parte del, del mondo e noi abbiamo adottato uno schema che oggi è evidentemente in crisi e va ripensato per risolvere quelle contraddizioni che lei diceva ma credo che Ugo abbia qualcosa da aggiungere anche a beneficio dei nostri studenti su questo punto che mi sembra importantissimo 
it is it is the issue of the difference between what is settled as law, what is constituted, and what is in the making, what is constituent. And uh, modernity has constituted power into a certain kind of constitutional orders, which assume a certain kind of relationship between uh, the lawgiver and those that ha are supposed to obey to the law, on the understanding, and that was very Hobbesian, that the lawgiver, the sovereign, was actually acting in the interest of everybody. Uh, today, it is clear that the lawgiver is not acting in the interest of everybody anymore. He's actually acting in the interest of very powerful private uh, corporate interests that do push in a certain direction that has no connection with the general interest itself. And, and this is actually completely, uh, has a completely changed the uh, constitutional balance of power. And our constitutions are simply incapable of dealing with this. So the uh, struggle today is at a constituent level, is to change the fundamental rules of the game. And uh, this battle, this constitutional ground has been already taken over by the capital and, its, and the forces that obey to it, and the social movements are supposed to do the same thing. The problem is that the social movements are on the side of resistance, and resistance requires uh, the exercise of a duty, which is not just a right, it's a duty, to resist to a legal order when the legal order is actually bringing us in a direction that is disruptive and can uh, bring no, us nowhere. And, but the rhetoric of legality, legality is very much deployed to criminalize all of these people or the, all of these populations, all of these uh, individuals that actually struggle for a better world. And the use of the criminal sanction, the use of the punitive uh, forces and the um, oppressive apparatuses of the states are deployed very much uh, in, this, in this kind of way. So I don't think that there is going to be transformation without resistance. I don't think there is resistance without some risk. And I don't think that there is the possibility to transform the law from the better, uh, for the better if you are not willing to actually get a frontal challenge against it when it's just not working in the interest of everybody. So I'm, I'm afraid that this transitional part when it comes to the law requires some risk and some capacity by the people to resist the order. And if the people that resist are many, then they are those that are making the legal system. The legal system only changes for the good and for the interest of everybody if actually everybody is taking some risk in trying to do that. If we expect that happening as an octroi by some sort of good, friendly ruler, that is not going to happen. Well, you are the chairman, so you have to Ringraziamo quindi, quindi tutti, credo che due ore e mezza eh, siano state più che sufficienti per eh, approfondire il tema, per avere una, un overview larga eh, sulla eh, qualità di, di 30 anni, 40 anni di d'opera di Fritti of Capra, lo ringraziamo molto per la sua presenza qui oggi a Torino, eh, speriamo di averlo di nuovo molto presto e di leggerlo anche presto eh, in italiano, è un, è un invito ai due autori del, di The Ecology of Law di eh, proporlo al grande pubblico italiano, soprattutto, mi permetto di dire ai giuristi, perché smuova le acque del, del diritto in Italia. Thank you very much, uh, Frizio Capra, Grazie. for your Grazie. excellent Thank talk. You.